Hey, how you doing, Sec Plus Preppers? Welcome back. These are the IT Dojo Security Plus questions of the day. I'm Colin Weaver. I ask you two questions every single day, hopefully getting you more prepared for your exam so that you are successful come exam day. Let's go ahead and get right in it. All right, my first question for you today is right here. And as you read it, what it says is you have servers that process some sensitive financial information and you need to segment those particular servers from the rest of the network. However, you still need to be able to allow under certain conditions for the flow of information from those servers to other areas of your network. Given this list of choices, which of them could you implement in order to be able to accomplish that? So you need to be able to provide for the isolation as well as the actual flow of data. So give those some thought. When you're ready, click on play again after you pause this and then we can talk about it. Okay, first choice on the list is one of the right answers. A firewall will absolutely go in and do this. So you could place a firewall in between these servers that are processing this sensitive information and the rest of your network, and then go in and create rule sets on your firewall that define the conditions under which data is allowed to flow back and forth. Now, the default rule whenever a firewall is involved is gonna be that no data is allowed to flow back and forth, and so you're going to have to go in and explicitly create rules that say that these particular ports and protocols are allowed to go from here to there. So from this source using these ports and protocols over to this destination using these ports and protocols. Choice number two says go in and use a layer two switch with Mac filtering. That's not gonna accomplish your objective. Uh, layer two uh, Mac filtering uh, on just a plain old you know, ethernet switch, the only thing that's gonna do is allow you to have some very rudimentary control over which devices are allowed to be connected to which switch ports. And that's not gonna accomplish uh, your segmentation objectives, nor is it gonna accomplish your bi-directional flow of data only under conditional circumstances objectives. And so it does nothing for you in this particular regard. Next item on the list says that you should use a host-based intrusion prevention system. Um, no, it's not gonna help you. Uh, well, it's going to help you from an intrusion prevention perspective. It's not going to help you as far as your network segmentation and data flow needs. So don't choose that answer. All right, well, how about a web proxy? No. A web proxy in this context is going to be a, uh, a server or service running on a server that you're going to submit a web request to that is going to then be evaluated based upon a set of rules that are defined. And then if it's acceptable, the content's going to be retrieved from the internet for you and returned back to the web proxy who's then going to serve it back up to you. Uh, that does not accomplish the objectives that we're trying to do here. So uh, while web proxies are great and wonderful, they do not do this. All right, how about a DMZ? That's, that's like a section or portion of a network. So just having a DMZ does not do anything as far as allowing the flow of data. That's just describing some no man's land where you put certain services. So no. Okay, packet filtering router. Yes, packet filtering router is really just first generation firewall. Okay, you got a router which has the capacity to allow data to flow back and forth between different networks. Um, and it acts as a network segmentation device to go in and do that. So that accomplishes our ability to have the flow of data between these two uh, different portions of your network where these sensitive servers are and then the rest of the network. And then because we can create access control lists, we can then have those, that router be, um, be more discriminating in its decisioning to go in and say, am I willing to let these particular packets, uh, ports or protocols flow back and forth? And so that is the essence of you know, packet filtering or, or just firewalling 101, as I would sometimes refer to it as. Um, so that'll absolutely do it. So you have firewalls, which will do it, which you know, there's more advanced firewalls, certainly in today's day and age. And then you just have packet filtering routers, which are also, in, in a very uh, sort of simplistic sense, still firewalls. And then your last choice on the list is for you to go in and air gap the network. Uh, air gap the network, if you're not familiar with that term, simply means that uh, you have one network and then there's another network and there's nothing but air in between. In other words, there is no connectivity in between. And since we have a requirement for there to be flow of data in between these networks, um, if there's an air gap in there, the data is not simply not going to flow. There's no physical capacity for it to do so. Um, with the exception of you copying all the data to you know, a, a Blu-ray or a DVD or something like that and then walking it over to another computer on the other network. And I'm going to wager that that's not really what we're endeavoring to do here. So, no, that is not the right answer. So in this particular case, packet filtering router and a firewall would both accomplish your objectives. All right, here comes question number two, sticking at you, I guess, in the firewall theme today. 
uh, you are configuring your router to allow this particular list of protocols to flow from your internal network out to the internet. My question to you is, given these answer choices, which of the following are going to be the appropriate things for you to go in and configure? Now, that's a fairly long list, so go ahead and click pause, look it over, and then when you're ready, click play again, and then we can talk about what the right answers are. All right, this question turns into a big giant ball of uh, one, from an exam perspective, which is know your ports, and two, uh, know basic packet structures and know source and destination values dependent upon the uh, layer of the uh, packet structure that you're dealing with. So it's important to understand source and destination IP address, source and destination ports, uh, protocols um, that are used uh, at the transport layer for specific application layer protocols. All that stuff is going to be stuff that's going to be important for you to make sure that you feel good about come exam time. So the first two choices say that you need to allow HTTP and HTTPS to be able to flow out to the internet. Now, Web servers listen on port 80 for plain text HTTP communications, and they listen on port 443. Both of those are TCP-based communications. HTTP is TCP-based. So the port that they listen on, port 80 and port 443, for uh, plain text transmissions and encrypted in transmissions, respectively, um, you're going to need to make sure that the traffic that is leaving your network is destined to those ports. So TCP port 80 in the destination and TCP port 443 in the destination. The source port coming from inside your network is going to be some port greater than 1024. Now that's generic because it's going to be somewhat OS dependent, but you're going to use what we refer to as an ephemeral port or a dynamic or temporary port that you're going to go in to source your traffic from and then it's going to be destined to TCP port 80 for HTTP or destined to TCP port 443 for HTTPS. The next one on the list that you needed to allow is the Remote Desktop Protocol, or RDP. RDP servers historically have listened on port 3389 or 3389. So when traffic is leaving your network, again, it's going to come from an ephemeral port, some random port that's going to be temporarily used for this particular connection. And it's then going to be destined to TCP port 3389, which is the port that uh, RDP servers typically listen on. SMTP also needs to be allowed, SMTP servers. Um, in this particular answer choice, in terms of all we have, is TCP port 25. So SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, is a TCP-based protocol, and uh, the, traditionally SMTP servers listen on port 25. Now, that is for plain text SMTP transmissions, which are uh, still common, but, but increasingly less common as we move more and more and more into the mobile world. Um, but uh, for, since we weren't given other choices as far as other ports like 465 and stuff like that, we, all we have in this answer is TCP port 25, but it's the destination. So the um, SMTP servers are listening on port 25, so you're going to go outbound from an ephemeral port to TCP port 25. And then the very last choice is you need to get some uh, DNS queries out, UDP uh, port 53. Now, uh, the overwhelming majority of DNS query related traffic that you're going to see on a network is going to be coming from an ephemeral port going to port 53 because that's the port that DNS servers listen on for incoming name resolution queries or requests. And uh, the, again, the overall majority of them are going to be UDP. It is possible for them to be TCP based. Um, it's just not as common. But that may change over time, which we can save for another day's question. But for right now, UDP port 53, as far as the destination uh, port field, is what you're looking for. So let's summarize that. HTTP needs destination port 80 TCP. HTTPS needs TCP port 443 in the destination field. Um, RDP needs TCP port 3389 in the destination field. SMTP needs destination port 25 TCP. And DNS needs UDP port 53 in the destination field. Sweet. Two more questions down. Nice. Good job. Hope you did well on those, and I hope they help you as you continue to prep for your exam. We'll get that out eventually. Um, please click on the like button down below. Tell your friends if you got other people that you know who are studying for this exam. I'll appreciate that. Subscribe if you want to get these every single day. And I'll be back tomorrow. See you later.